Welcome to the Friends with Money podcast, brought to you by Money Magazine, creating financial freedom for Australians since 1999. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Friends with Money podcast. My name is Michelle Baltazar. I'm the editor-in-chief here at Money Magazine. Thank you for joining us. Today, I'm joined by Scott O'Neill, who is the Managing Director of Rethink Investing, the largest buyer's agency in commercial property here in Australia. So over the course of running the business and setting up the business, um, Scott has actually built a $3 billion property portfolio on behalf of their clients. Um, Scott, thank you for joining us. Very good to be here, Michelle. No worries. Now, you know that property investing is the official blood sport here in Australia. We all love to talk about property, uh, but you have kind of a, a different approach to it. You're saying, let's rethink this and not be talking about residential property. Tell us more about that. Yeah, exactly right. I I had to learn by actually experiencing the limitations of residential property. So, you know, bought a numerous properties over the years. We started just after the GFC, my wife and I, and uh, we reached a point where the cash flow just was not high enough to retire from. Because if you may, um, you know, compare numbers for, for, with residential to commercial, you're looking at probably, you know, four or 5% gross returns in residential. And by the time you take out your outgoings, you, you're only really going to collect about a 2% net return. And that's not much when your interest rates are four, five, 6%. Now, commercial, you're looking minimum 6% net. So by definition, that's triple the, the return. And, and that's why I was attracted to the asset class in the first place, because you need income to retire from. You need income to scale portfolios. You just... You can't get by with the returns in residential. So I guess that's where the rethink came from. Just just don't go down that old barbecue topic of residential. It's it's a bit of a flogged horse, which I don't think has the the legs to kind of help you retire properly unless you have a very large capital base. So it's um I just think there's faster ways to do it. Absolutely. Now I'm just going to pause there for a second because I know that a lot a lot of people are kind of trying to digest this idea that residential property investing is not the way to go, but definitely look at commercial property. Now, let's talk about you personally then. So how much have you invested in this sector? So I've purchased personally, we've got a current portfolio of 65 million and we've got a couple more properties under contract. So in the next few months, we should be close to the 75 million mark. And um You know, they're quite large numbers and we would never have got there with residential purely. So we we ended up selling off a lot of the residential properties we bought in our earlier investing journey. And and it was really just to help, uh, I guess, help the cash flow equation because you'd sell an asset getting a, you know, a 2% net return and buying something with a 7% return. And it just makes life a lot easier with the banks, with the month to month cash flow and, uh, you know, it it scales harder and better. And we we target assets that perform well in the current economy too. Like COVID was was really interesting because it it punished some businesses but supercharged others. And and we were targeting the assets that were doing well, like supermarkets, medical investments, and even the industrial markets have done extremely well. And uh, and that's probably one of the other benefits of industrial, or sorry, commercial property rather, is you can target you're, I guess, investing a little bit more than residential instead of just buying almost a homogenous product, which kind of all goes up and down at similar rates. You can actually pick parts of the economy which will do better than others in commercial. So let's say, for example, you've given me two very important numbers there. One is that you have a personal portfolio of around 65 million and two, commercial property can generate yields of around 6% versus residential property, which is 2%. But I'm I'm probably putting you on the spot here, but what kind of passive income are we talking about per month that your client would get? Or, you know, if you want to disclose 65 million, what does that mean in terms of income on a monthly basis? Yeah, look, I I actually did the annual numbers. Just um, look, we're we're around seven figures, just just over in terms of passive income. So we're about half debt in our portfolio, you know, under under half debt. So probably about forty forty five is is the current position. And 
And that obviously uh, has shrunk our income since interest rates have you know, gone up, but we've purchased more as well. But one of the really good things about a high inflation economy is you also get high rental growth as well. So sure, the, uh, the rental growth has not fully been offset um, or offset the increases in interest rate costs, but uh, yeah, but it, it's on the right direction, you know. So, so rental growth is very important for anyone with a, a portfolio, and because without it, you're not going to get that long-term growth as well. Because especially with a commercial property, a lot of the capital growth is derived from the, I guess, the growth you get from rents as well. So, um, to answer your question, like our average client, it depends on their debt levels. It's it's a pretty hard question to answer, but our average client purchase is probably in the mid one mil, you know, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. Let's say they take a million dollar debt on that. So their cost is 60,000. And if they're getting a property with a, let's say it's a 1.5 mil asset and, you know, they might be netting 120 grand off that, but then you've got to minus the mortgage cost on it. So you're normally getting like 30, 40, 50, 60 grand of passive income, depending on the specifics of their debt and the face yield you're getting on the property. But the main important thing to bring up is you are getting a positive cash flow from day one. And that's something you will never get with uh, residential. So again, there's the buzzword there, positive cash flow. Uh, You mentioned in the book you co-authored, Rethink Property Investing, that positive cash flow is one of the important things about commercial property, especially now where you talked about people who are kind of focusing on property because of negative gearing, but many of our listeners are either approaching retirement or they're just doing part-time work, so they don't really need that kind of the tax impact on that. Tell us more about this. Well, look, you get all the same benefits out of commercial as well. Like you, you, there's very good depreciation benefits, which is a way of saving tax as well. And uh, I guess, look, the reason people go into residential to start with, and probably the main benefit is you can get a higher debt level. So you can go in there and get a 90, maybe even a 95% loan. That's right. So obviously, first-time investors will target that because it requires less cash. Now, they just need a good job to support that debt because, you know, you're, you're in this negative cash flow situation and, you know, you just got to hold on until the equation improves and it'll it'll be done by two things, you paying down debt or the rent growing in time. So if you're lucky enough to have more cash up front or you're someone who's refinancing their family home, you might have access to a larger deposit. They're the types of clients that we work with generally because from a return point of view, it is superior, but it does require capital. And that's, I guess, the main reason that holds people back out of commercial because you know, not everyone has large amounts of capital lying around in a bank account. So, you know, it's a luxury, but it's uh, it's an asset class that does suit those who are, you know, ready for it. Who, who have um, a little bit of, of cash. And, and that happens with some people when, for example, uh, they've come to an inheritance and suddenly they have a lump sum that they're considering, well, what do I do next? So let's say one of our listeners is starting from scratch. They're in their 30s or 40s. They're hoping to get started in commercial property investing based on your approach. What is the first thing they need to do, assuming they have that capital, whether it's 100,000, as you've mentioned in the book? Yeah, good question. So I think education is the key. So look, the reason we wrote uh, our book back, you know, it was Back about 2019, we've actually got a new edition coming out in September 23, just to sort of update with the current interest rates. But learning about the asset class is really the key because the more you understand it, the less frightening it is. And you can just see the numbers for what they are and you can dispel some of the myths that people say. Like, you know, there's myths like commercial property doesn't grow in capital growth. Like in the next book, we actually quantify exactly how much capital growth they've received since you know, over the last 30 years for each asset class. And um, it's very interesting to see the results. It's uh, it's fascinating. And all these myths uh, are, are probably important to get over before you get into the asset class. So you want to understand what types of properties uh, take long, long periods to fill. Some can be filled within a few weeks. Some take three months. Um, it, there's differences between different asset classes. Like you probably wouldn't want to race into an office market right now because there's a lot of vacancy people working from home. But if you learn about different asset classes like industrial property, for example, you might be excited by the possibilities. So education is the key. And then yeah, having the capital, like you need about 150 grand cash because that's a 30% deposit. 
on a 500 grand property. So if you've got that, you can, you can start looking at the asset class financially. And then you just got to have the right experts around you, like the, you know, a commercial mortgage broker, a commercial lawyer, maybe a commercial buyer's agency. So there are all these different experts that will, I guess, de-risk the situation and bring opportunities to you. But what about someone who only has $25,000 to start with? Are there any options for them to have exposure to commercial property type returns? Yeah, look, most people or anyone with a super fund will have access to manage funds generally. Like it's part of uh, it's part of a fund manager's job to put some of it into property. So, you know, you've got you know all the different like they're called real estate investment trusts where they they're basically like big commercial syndicates. So they they own large buildings in the city and and everyone probably owns a little bit about it without you knowing about it, even in your super fund. So you can purchase into trusts and syndicates like that uh, with lower amounts of capital. And uh, the other the other way to do it is just start at residential, save up money, get into it, let the capital growth from residential build. And then in a few years' time, you can then refinance that. And instead of just going into another house or a unit, which will be negatively geared and it it will it'll make it harder for you financially, you might then use your second or third purchase to go into commercial to improve that, I guess, that cash flow ratio. Now, I'm glad that you mentioned interest rates and that you are going to publish uh, an update in September considering the the higher interest rates now. But how has your strategy changed uh, because of this? Well, it, it really hasn't changed at all because we always factored in higher interest rates. Like back when the first book was written, we were looking at interest rates, you know, it got down to like under 2% for a commercial loan. Like I remember I took a commercial loan and my wife and I bought a KFC and a Hungry Jacks and we, the, the loan was 1.9% interest rate. So it was like free money. Never did I think that was going to last forever. So we mm. always factored in much higher rates and, and made sure we were happy with the equation if rates went up 2 or 3%. Now they have gone up that much, but also all the rent growth has happened a lot quicker too. So you're getting better yields now. Now the margin between yield and interest rate is not as great as it was, but we're seeing potentially at the peak of the cycle interest rates. Like whether there's another rate increase again or, or you know or not, it doesn't make a big difference to us because you're buying yields of you know six, seven, eight percent, and uh, and that means you're still cash flow positive because you, like. I'm paying about 5.6% on my interest rates currently and um, and that'll fluctuate over the years, but over time that rent growth will keep building. So you just got to have a long-term picture and, and not worry. You don't make a decision based on today's rate solely. You've got to be buying properties with the right fundamentals. You're, you're planning to hold for the long term. So what I'm more interested in, in what is the average interest rate you think it'll be over a 10-year period? Because that is the quantum amount of interest you'll pay. That's a lot of more important. That, that is a great tip because then you are really looking at uh, your capacity to kind of make sure you, you know, you're not under duress because you're not really assuming 1.9% forever. Uh, you are looking at the, the 6 to 7%, which seems like no one thought that it would happen that quickly, though. I mean, we did look at 13, 14 interest rate rises in the space of 14 months. But um, I, I was reminded a couple of weeks ago that at one point, interest rates for residential property was 18, 19% at one point. Yeah, exactly. And even back then, like you've got to look at how quickly it came down after that, you know, and, and you sort of, again, it's it's about the total interest rate costs over a long period and you all add it up and average it out. That's that's how you make your decisions. And and I think a lot of people did that, like mortgage arrears right now, even after 13 or 14 increases, they're very low. You know, people are quite, uh, you know, there's obviously, especially in commercial, the, the arrears are almost non-existent. Because people have built cash flow buffers up, they're still positively geared. There's more sophisticated investors in that space too. So you know they're very low debt levels on average. And like most people we purchase commercial properties from, the owners have no debt because they've had it for 20, 30 years, and you know they they bought it with cash back then. That's kind of the space we're in. So I'm quite bullish about the commercial market because 
basically there's there's a short supply of good stock out there and people are all fighting over what's there and you know we need more properties for sale and that's the theme that's uh i think going to govern the next 6 to 12 months i do feel that there is there still needs to be a lot of education around this because as you've rightly pointed out there are different asset classes because residential property investing just feels easier to understand for a lot of people did you feel like you had to walk your clients through a journey of understanding it for 6 to 8 months before they even you know took their money out of their wallets to invest or what what's been the experience for you uh yeah look it's a good question because we found that in the early days there was a lot more education i i feel like over time uh there's our clients are getting more and more i wouldn't say aggressive but but just ready to make quick decisions for commercial property because they are more understanding of the asset classes like they they follow what we're doing they they read the financial review regularly they read magazines like there, there's a lot more education and talk about commercial property in the mainstream media which probably wasn't there 5 years ago um and that helps so people realize it it is uh, a good asset class and and once they sort of understand the tenant that they're buying into or the exact location then they can make as as quick decision as they would for residential but you are right residential is easier to get an understanding like you you're not going to get punished for your mistakes uh, in residential badly you know if you buy the a terrible house it's probably going to perform quite similar to something that's you know a few streets down that's the best house you know you might just have more maintenance like there's not a great uh, gotcha in that kind of market but you know and unless you buy in a big flood zone and miss that somehow but commercial if you buy something that is not going to appeal to businesses and you you don't have that common i guess you know that understanding of business in general it can hurt you because you don't want to be the guy that bought the property down a back alley that no one wants to walk through you know because that won't tenant you know but again it's all about quality and location and and uh, if you can get that right then the risks are lower absolutely i know that you did mention in your book that the first thing that you would ask someone to look at is core logic and how a warehouse in the the location that you're looking at will perform on average or if the sick if there's a six month wait for a tenant for example but my favorite section uh is the one where you said check your number so you don't overpay do you find that most people overpay and and why is that i uh, they do add a lot of auctions so one thing i see a novice commercial investor do is is they will go to the, an auction and see a mcdonald's for sale or a shell service station just something with a big long lease they get attracted to the security of the asset and they will pay sometimes millions of dollars too much for an asset just because they they're buying into the perceived security of an asset see as a commercial investor i've never bought a property for the tenant i buy it because of its location because i always assume tenants will leave like even if you buy the most blue chip well known business known to mankind they may outgrow the space or there might be a new competitor come in or there there's always question marks so you got to be buying a property you're happy to relet and you never overpay for a tenant and that's something i see that happens almost every day mm. out there people people just buy for the tenant instead of buying for the building you know you'd never do that in a residential you wouldn't just go oh, i'm going to buy that house because there's a great family living in that that Can property you like the same that's just yeah, silly exactly and I, like obviously it's a little bit more um, stretched in the commercial sense but you still should not only buy a property for the tenant and um you know you, you just got to be confident that you could relet it and um yeah and and most properties could be if you're buying right well what i'm taking away i guess from this interview is that number one commercial property offers much higher yield than residential property and i think people need to really think about that especially now that we are in the middle of you know fastest inflation rate ever um and then the second thing as well that i i understand from you is that you you definitely still need to do your research so that higher yield doesn't come easy you need to make sure that you you do your research That's right. And there's no shortcuts in commercial property like it's don't come into it think it's just going to be an easy ride. The returns are higher for a reason because basically there's more sophisticated investors, you've got to weigh up the risks of it and um when you get it right you will make more money out of this. Like 
I've done this myself with, with my wife for like our returns and capital growth and net cash flow from the commercial property is is far superior than our best ever result in residential. But it's come through through knowledge and picking the right assets. It's it's kind of almost like investing in the stock market. You know, you can't just randomly pick any any stock. You've got to kind of get in there and understand the sort of the granular markets of what's growing and what's not. And um and when you can do that, then yeah, you will get superior returns and and uh yeah, and but you'll be punished if you get it wrong. And that's that's just a big disclaimer to anyone out there if you're just going onto one of the big commercial real estate websites and buying something you've seen off the internet, you know, you've got to do your due diligence and and that's uh that's what you must focus on. Well said. Do your due diligence. Now, I feel a little bit more confident about exploring this, um, Scott, because I myself am a residential property investor. So I need to look at this more. Thank you once again for your time and and congratulations. I mean, not everyone gets to build a $65 million portfolio and uh, retire early, right? So you, you're just doing this out of passion now. You could be in Greece right now if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah. Now we've got a passion for just educating people on this asset class. It's been really good to to us, and uh, it's just good fun to you know if if you're into property, you you know you just you stick to it really, no matter what. So yeah, it's all good. Now, before we go, don't forget that if you enjoy listening to the Friends with Money podcast, we'd love for you to recommend it to your own friends and family, or you can help us out by leaving a review on iTunes or the Apple podcast app. You can also send in any questions, comments, or even topics, more on commercial property investing, if you'd love for us to cover that through our dedicated email, podcast at moneymag.com.au. And finally, make sure you head over to moneymag.com.au for all the latest financial news and stories. That's it for this episode. I'm Michelle Baltazar. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Friends with Money podcast. For credible, independent and easy to understand financial commentary, visit moneymag.com.au. Please remember that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are general in nature and further independent advice and research based on your personal circumstances should be sought before making an investment decision.